Well, I think we will get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us for Wander Washington today. I would like to introduce you to your host, Mike Moe. So Mike is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Tourism Development for the Washington Tourism Alliance, which is the state's tourism destination marketing organization. Born and raised in Washington, Mike has worked with the WTA since 2012 and loves sharing the vast array of experiences available in his home state. With that, I'll let you take it away, Mike. All right, thank you, Darby. My name is Mike Mo, and as always, I'm coming to you live from our basement. As you know, every other week we have visited a new destination around our amazing state to talk to local experts about what you can expect when you visit. So far, we've been to Leavenworth, Bellingham, Walla Walla, Long Beach, Port Towns, and the Gorge, the Metau Valley, Whidbey Island, Spokane, Tri-Cities, San Juan Islands, and Yakima. If you've missed one and you want to catch up, make sure to check the chat later for links to every episode. And as always, you can explore on your own on the state tourism website, experiencewa.com. That's experiencewa.com. So today, our conversation's a little bit different, uh, and it will, it'll span the entire state. We're going to talk uh, to people who are working in sustainable tourism and talk about what people are doing around Washington to promote uh, making responsible choices when looking for experiences in our state. We'll talk to Tommy Ferris, the owner of Olympic Hiking Company, and he'll tell us about how his company encourages safe outdoor recreation. And then he'll tell us about the National Recreate Responsibly movement that started here in Washington State. Uh, then we'll talk to Caroline Ferguson from 21 Acres, located right in your backyard in Woodenville. She'll talk about the sustainable farming that happens there and how you and your family can participate in educational events and then shop at their hyper-local farm market. Our third guests are Lisa and Jay Anderson from uh, Foundry Vineyards in Walla Walla. They're going to talk to us about uh, how they make their award-winning organic wine. Now, before we talk to our guests today, I do want to acknowledge the, COVID's, uh, the, the governor's COVID orders. Our goal on this show is to provide you with a little education around the amazing activities that we have to offer in Washington. So once this COVID crisis is over, you'll be better prepared to take uh, to enjoy our spectacular state. I will say that we're in phase three now, so hopefully you're planning at least one or two trips this summer. However, whatever you do in Washington, please stay safe. So with that caveat, I want to introduce our first expert. His name is uh, Tommy Ferris, and he is the owner of the Olympic Hiking Company. Welcome, Tommy. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate being here today. Well, thank you. Uh, so tell us a, a little bit about your company and how it came to be. Yeah, so I grew up here on the Olympic Peninsula in Port Angeles, and I had no idea how lucky I was to have the Olympic Mountains, rainforest, and coast in my backyard. I uh, Ended up moving to Seattle to go to college at University of Washington and had six years in Seattle. And it took moving away to really appreciate how special a place Olympic Peninsula and Olympic National Park is. Uh, my business, Olympic Hike & Co., actually started as a business school project that I just couldn't stop working on. Once I started solo hiking the park to build the website content, I was floored at the natural beauty of the area. That passion brought me back to Port Angeles and starting Olympic Hike & Co. full time. It was just me and a 12 passenger van that first year. And uh, since then, we've done five uh, full seasons in Olympic National Park. And today we offer uh, guided day trips, uh, backpacker trailhead shuttles, guided backpacking trips and custom private tours throughout Olympic National Park. Cool. So what's it, what is it like to actually take one of your tours? Like if you're going to go on an overnight tour, what, what is that? What is that? What's the experience for, say, a Microsoft employee? Yeah. So, I mean, we have a variety of experiences. Also start kind of with the day trips. So for a Microsoft employee coming from the Seattle area, we have, uh, you know, guided day trips for a half day tour that allows folks that, you know, they can take public transportation and join us at Hurricane Ridge, for example. Otherwise, uh, with our full day group tours or custom private tour experiences, we do a lot of full day uh, private tours or custom trips out to the whole rainforest and Pacific coast. What makes Olympic National Park so special is the incredible eco diversity you can get a rainforest adventure, the Olympic Wilderness Coast, lakes, glacier cap mountains, and everything in between within a two hour drive. And so we kind of have a variety of uh, day trips offered. Maybe they want to take a backpacker trailhead shuttle and uh, do a 20 mile through hike on a multi night backpacking trip. And this summer we're launching our guided backpacking trips where we'll do three group backpacking trips that will really cover the basics of how to backpack, you know, what to bring, uh, gear packing, how to cook your meals in the backcountry, getting water, and really getting to enjoy those spaces uh, for more than one day at a time. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing, especially for those who want to get out, you know, kind of away from, every, from everything. That seems like a really great way to do it. Um, so talk about how you teach sustainability and how sustainability, you know, really is a, a huge part of what you do. 
Yeah, I mean, Olympic National Park, uh, you know, doing these tours in these beautiful wilderness areas, sustainability is at the forefront. We want to preserve these viewpoints and these destinations to look the same uh, for the years to come. I mean, you're seeing old growth trees that can be up to 1,000 years old in the whole rainforest. And we're seeing the glaciers in the Olympic Mountains. They're receding a bit. And so our climate really matters to making sure that these glaciers and the rivers and the rainforest, everything looks, uh, you know, the same for our future travelers out here. So on a guided trip with us, you're not only going to learn the basics of hiking and safety, um, avalanche safety for winter trips, but we're also hopefully going, going to inspire travelers to learn more about why it's important to protect these natural places, why it's important to leave no trace, and to make sure that these beautiful forests and rivers stay, stay the same for the future generations. Um, it, it's incredible diversity we have here, and it's amazing to see what happens when we leave these places completely untouched and let Mother Nature do its thing. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So um, now the Re recreate responsibly movement. I know it started here in Washington State, but it's gone you know all national. Tell us about that movement and how it kind of got started and and where it's going from here. Yeah, so you know in the peak of COVID, uh, when things uh, were starting to shut down last March, when public lands began to close, we found it difficult to have good information on what's open, what's closed, and how to recreate responsibly during COVID nineteen. So there was a group that was primarily led by public land managers, the Washington Trails Association and REI, that kind of all banded together to say, hey, let's create some unified guidelines for how to recreate responsibly during COVID-19. And so they created six guidelines of knowing uh, of, you know, to how to re recreate responsibly. It includes knowing before you go, you know, is this place even open? Uh, if it's going to be crowded, do you have a backup destination to practice physical distancing on the trails? to plan ahead and making sure that you have all of your self-sufficient supplies and expecting other things to be closed like visitor centers and restrooms. Playing it safe, making sure that you're picking an activity that's in your comfort zone. Um, we don't wanna further strain our search and rescue teams already in, in the height of COVID and keeping our hospital, you know, our hospital levels at good rates. Um, exploring locally, encouraging local recreation when at the time in March, we wouldn't need to be traveling long distances and to leave no trace uh, to make sure that we're leaving only footsteps and taking photographs and nothing else. We want to make sure that we're not going off trail, damaging you know flora and fauna that you know really is dependent on us staying on trail and making sure that we leave that to to, to leave it as beautiful as can be. And the main overarching guideline in the Recreate Responsibly Coalition is to build an inclusive outdoors for everyone. We want to make sure that the outdoors is accessible and ready and open for everybody that wants to learn more about how to recreate responsibly. And so that really got started in March, and this Washington group sparked a national coalition. And now there's guidelines that you can find on recreateresponsibly.org that can help you in all four seasons of exploring, not only nationwide, but here in Washington State. So it's not just about COVID. It's actually going to be a movement that's going forward and, and helping people do the right thing when they're out uh, recreating. Yeah, an example of that was new guidelines that came out this winter because, you know, with so many indoor dining options closed and indoor entertainment options closed, we saw unprecedented levels of visitation at snow parks and different outdoor winter areas. And so it was helping educate folks that might be getting out in winter the first time. What is avalanche safety all about? Where do you find that information? Are you picking a winter safe route? Knowing that you know a, a summer hiking trail can look much different in the winter. So I think this coalition is gonna continue to put out guidance to make sure that, like, like I said earlier, we're really building a, an inclusive outdoors for everyone, that everybody has access to this information and we can all learn together and to, um, we, we're excited to see the new visitors out on the trails. Now it's our job to make sure that it's done re responsibly and that we keep right. these places beautiful. You mentioned earlier about a backup plan. Uh, and I think it's really important because often you go and all of a sudden you get to the, the parking lot. It's totally overrun. Where do people go to, to, to find the resources they need to have that backup plan? Yeah, I think it's a variety of places and destinations that you can visit. So the first thing I like to do is I like to go on Washington Trails Association, so WTA.org, to kind of get updated trip reports. What does the snowpack look like? Um, are the parking lots full? You know, what are the trail conditions like? And, and if you do a hike, you know, update that trip report so you can help other travelers with that information. Uh, go to your local visitor bureau. Give them a call or check out their local website. Um, if you're going to a national park, for example, go to the Hurricane Ridge uh, you know, Visitor Center when that's open and staffed. Go to the different visitor centers throughout uh, Washington State to make sure um, you talk to maybe a ranger or any kind of visitor center employees that can help get you that right information. And this summer, as far as having a plan B, yeah, do that research. I think you should always have a plan B. We saw really uh, busy summers uh, in our public lands, and that was without international travelers visiting our national parks. And that was with much lower out-of-state travelers. So. 
with things opening up this summer, I think it's very important to get those early starts and to always have a backup plan in mind because I think it's going to be a very busy summer. And for that, you know, part of getting into nature is experiencing that solitude. So do your part, do your research that it's a hike that you're ready for, you're prepared for, and that you can get out there and experience some nice quiet time on the trails. Awesome. So any other tips, you know, for people who are looking to get outside this summer? I would just say find a hiking buddy and do your research and make sure that you're picking uh, picking hikes in your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to contact companies like ours. You know, our guided hikes aren't just about us leading on a trail. We want to help you learn more about the natural history of the area. Make sure that you, get, you gain the skills to start hiking on your own. Maybe you want to backpack for the first time. Utilize the local uh, local companies throughout Washington State. They're here to help you. They're here to educate you and inspire you for future outdoor travels. What a great time to support our local tourism economy coming out the pandemic. It'd be a great time to be a tourist in your own backyard, book a kayak tour, book a kayak or a hiking tour, and um, you know help these great suppliers across Washington State. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Tommy. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Up next, we have Caroline Ferguson, and she is the farm market manager for 21 Acres right in your backyard there in Woodenville. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So tell me about 21 Acres. Like, what, what is 21 Acres? We, uh, we get asked that a lot. We are a um, nonprofit food and agriculture education center located in Woodenville. Um, we are as per our name, we're located on 21 acres of um, regenerative farmland, and we also have a uh, LEED Platinum certified building on our land. Cool. So how, how did your uh, property come to be? What's the history behind 21 acres? Yeah, so we are over a decade old at this point. Um, our organization started in collaboration with the local Farmers Market Association. Um, they were looking for sort of a permanent space, and um, what we uh, figured out during that collaboration is that we really had an unmet uh, need in the community for a space to come together and learn about local food and sustainable living. Um, so we have been uh, going on about 10 years strong now. Cool. So um, you mentioned educational programming. Tell me about what that looks like. Yes. Um, so we do all sorts of things on our campus. Um, and uh, we have an amazing educational team that during COVID has been trying to create as many um, virtual opportunities that resemble in-person opportunities that we once had on our campus and hope to have again. Um, so we have farm tours, we have building tours for folks who are interested in green building techniques and, and technology. Um, we do field trips, we do all sorts of classes. Um, we have a really robust and strong volunteer program. Um, and of course we have the farm market, which is um, the, the aspect of the organization that I, I run. Cool. So the, the educational programs, are those mostly just for kids or are they like families? Can they, they attend as well? Yeah, we are really committed to being a space for families. Um, I think that we are really um, a wonderful organization for all ages. Um, and typically um, when, when COVID is not going on, um, our entire campus is open to the community whenever the building is open. So um, a lot of folks that just want a space to bring their kids, to run around with their kids, um, to uh, you know, just have a little bit of green space to go explore. They're always welcome to um, to go take a walk out on our farm. And all of our programs, I think, are really um, friendly for the whole family. And so is the farm market as well. Cool. And so, when, when you know, non-COVID times, you you have cooking classes too. And and uh, how do how do those work? Yeah, absolutely. We do cooking classes. We have all kinds of um, courses. We always welcome in um, community members that want to um, come and teach and learn. Um, we, um, yeah, we've done cooking classes. We've done like herbal medicine classes. Um, we have had yoga classes and Zumba classes in our space. Um, right now we have a really, really fascinating um, virtual uh, homesteading uh, course going on. So any kind of skill that you might want to learn that pertains to a sustainable lifestyle and food and agriculture, we've we've pretty much got it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know you guys do have some uh, a relationship with Microsoft. Um, what, 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 what have Microsoft employees done there before and how can they interact with you in the future? Yeah, absolutely. One, one way that people um, like to use our space is for team building and um, sort of organizational programming. And we have been lucky to have wonderful relationships with Microsoft in the past. We have done cooking classes for Microsoft. We've done tours, I believe. We've done volunteer 
um, you know, sort of group bonding volunteer days. Um, yeah, it's, we're lucky to be located in Woodenville where there's so many great um, companies and organizations around us and definitely Microsoft included. Cool. All right. Now tell me about your, your, your local farm uh, market that you, you are managing. What's that like? Yeah, so our farm market, um, it's basically, I think of it as kind of like a farmer's market where all different farms are um, available under one roof. Um, a lot of folks don't know that you can actually eat local all year round. There is local food available um, outside of the summer months. And so we are open year round. Um, currently, we're open Friday and Saturday, and we're going to expand to our four day schedule starting May 5th. Um, so that'll be Wednesday through Saturday. Um, I do all of our sourcing in the farm market every week. So that means, you know, reaching out to local farms, reaching, you know, um, utilizing local food distributors. Sorry, my, my cat just jumped in the background. <laughs> she okay. likes to be a special guest star. Um, so I do all of our sourcing. A lot of what we carry in our farm market, particularly during the summer months, um, is from our own farm. Um, but because we are a, a teaching farm, um, we're not super focused heavily on production. I also do lots of sourcing from other farms in um, the Sammamish Valley, which is just like the area kind of directly around 21 acres mm -hmm. and also greater Western Washington and also throughout the state. Um, so we've got local produce, um, it's all seasonal. Um, and we also have lots of other locally produced goods. So we have local meat, local dairy, eggs, um, cheeses, pantry products, grains, all sorts of stuff. Mm. And is that usually how people kind of first interact with 21 Acres or do they sign up for a class or how, how do people, you know, kind of get involved with, with what you guys do? Yeah, so especially during COVID, um, we've sort of considered ourselves uh, to be like the front door to the organization. Um, a lot of folks just find out about the farm market. Um, it's It's easier to wrap your head around than all of these different programs that we have going on. And then, you know, once they come in through the doors and they talk to our staff, they find out, oh, there's all sorts of opportunities here on campus. I could volunteer on the farm. I could join the volunteer beekeeping team. I could take a cooking class. I could do a field trip, any, anything like that. So um, yeah, we're, we're the one aspect of the organization that has remained fully open throughout COVID. Um, and so if you want to get involved, stopping in the farm market first is never a bad way to do that. Cool. So how, how has COVID impacted local farming? And you, and you, talk, you talk about your program, but actual local farming, how has it impacted uh, that? Yeah, it is hard to overstate the impact of COVID on our local food systems. Um, and, you know, of course, it's been a really, really challenging time and there are unique challenges that have come with COVID. But there's also been this kind of silver lining of a lot of people um, discovering their local food systems and, and figuring out what's being grown around them. Um, some of you listening to this call might have experienced, you know, going to the grocery store and trying to buy flour and realizing that the shelves were all empty. And a lot of our customers sort of realized like, oh, if there's no flour at the supermarket, I can find my local mills. I can find my local farms. I can, you know, figure out where this stuff is being grown around me and sort of um, support a decentralized, more resilient, more diverse agricultural system. Um, and so... You know, we had just um, so many folks find us for the first time during COVID, and I'm hoping that those um, those good habits remain after the pandemic. Well, what an amazing resource you are for for your area and uh, for Microsoft employees. So that's really cool. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for your time. And um, yeah. yeah, I will be visiting soon. I promise. We were lucky. Up next, we have Lisa and Jay Anderson. Uh, they're coming to us from Walla Walla today, and they are the co-owners of Foundry Vineyards. Welcome, Lisa and Jay. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for being here. So tell us about Fa Foundry Vineyards uh, um, and a little bit how it got started and, and what, what it's like today. Right. So um, our family planted our vineyard in 1998, and in 2003, we did our first vintage of wine. Um, it started out more as, I think, a hobby. We did a commemorative bottle for, we have another business that's in the arts, and so we started off with an artist series label. And then really from there, um, you know, our family became more interested in wine, and one bottle became two bottles. And then um, Jay and I really took over about five years ago. My brother is our winemaker, and he also manages our vineyard. Cool. Um, and so now you guys, you know, started out as a, as a normal vineyard, and then Jay, you've taken it the, the organic, you know, down the organic path. How, how did that come to be? Um, when I sort of took over doing the winemaking side of things, I also transitioned our home vineyard uh, to organic practices, which is about a three-year um, conversion process where you have to kind of document all of your uh, 
um, everything you're doing in the in the farming process um, to show that you're doing it on the up and up. And just last year, we received our official certification for that. But um, around the same time, around three years ago, we started sourcing from vineyards around the state of Washington that were growing organically. Um, so out, all the way out to like uh, the Columbia Gorge um, over in Yakima area um, and a few other few other locations. And we just kind of started phasing in um, the use of organic fruit in our wines until last year we were 100% um, organic, um, using sourcing only organic fruit uh, for all of our wines. So. Cool. Uh, and what does it take to actually get certified organic? Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite a bit of paperwork. <laughs> Funny part. Um, a lot of people will say like, oh yeah, like it's I can't I don't want to do organic certification for my farm or whatever because it's so expensive and there are actually some government subsidies I guess you could say like they'll reimburse you for a lot of the cost of going organic so it's really more the cost in my opinion of the time and energy um, and commitment of doing the paperwork and doing the farming so like if you're committed to that and you don't mind doing some paperwork and and, and records keeping then uh, then it can work out just fine um, but it's definitely a bit of extra paperwork that goes yeah. into it but um on the on the practical side like the uh, i would say that um the certification we have to get certified in our winery to produce organic fruit so or to produce organic wine so we can't just source the fruit and then say we have organic wine we actually have to prove it in the facility so we have an inspection annually where an inspector comes in and they do what's called like an audit or a trace back. So they'll look at one of our wines, they'll select one at random, and then we have to show documentation of that coming in as fruit and how it, where it went all along the process of becoming a wine so that we can prove that, that what we've done is meeting the standard that they've, uh, they've outlined, which basically means you're not using synthetic you know, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, things are all made from um, organic, uh, organic material. And, um, cool. And, yeah. So what, what kind of wine are you guys known for? Um, well, historically we've been known for kind of your Bordeaux reds and then moved into some, um, so like a Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot and, and the kind of Bordeaux style blends, which could include those grapes, plus maybe some Petit Bordeaux, Malbec, uh, Cab Franc. And then we kind of moved into some more Rhone varietals like Syrah and, uh, Grenache Blanc and Marsan and Roussan. And then in the last few years, the picture showing right now, we've moved into making uh, pet nat wines, which are uh, petulant natural is, the, is the, long, the long hand. It's a natural sparkling wine. So these are just bottled, so they look very cloudy. They are a little cloudy, but what happens is these wines, um, they settle out after they're bottled. So they bo we bottle them prior to the fermentation completing. So they, they sit in bottle, they finish fermenting, they build uh, CO2, and then we settle them out and um, they get a little contact with the yeast, which develops kind of like a nice roundness and sort of like a bread-like um, kind of yeast uh, flavor profile, which is really nice. And then we, um, we settle those out and then we do what's called disgorging, which is where you open that crown cap, that bottle cap, and you basically, the, the yeast will be forced out with hopefully without taking too much wine out of the mix and <laughs> pop that off and we'll recap it. And we recap it with a crown cap also. So it's, it's slightly more casual than the champagne cork um, production, but um, they're exciting wines. They're really fun. Uh, we make about six different uh, varieties of pet nats. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about that direction. And, and those wines are, are totally certified organic. So there's, there's some different levels with organic certification but if if you're all the way if it has that seal on the front that means there's no added sulfur either so that's that's the primary kind of antioxidant and preservative in wine mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole lot of discussion about that but it's you know it's just those wines don't don't really require it and so there's there's nothing added to those we also do uh, a lot of native fermentations so these are kind of natural fermentations that are you could also call them like wild or indigenous fermentations. so there's no added yeast or any really any additives at all in the process so they're kind of they're i'm excited about them from that standpoint because there's not a lot of people making wines that have nothing else to added but grapes cool all right so can you really tell the difference between like the we taste organic wine um i think so especially if if it's not um maybe if it's not heavily filtered or if 
defined in any way, then there's a little bit more, uh, there's a little more unpredictable qualities that can come into to, uh, the equation when you're making a wine from, from native yeast. So um, I think it, it opens a lot of opportunity uh, for kind of unexpected flavors and things. And, and we try to keep those flavors as positive as, poss as possible by, <laughs> by, you know, cleanliness in the winery and, um, and just staying really focused. We don't make a lot of wine and we make a lot of small lot wine. So we try to just focus on, on doing a great job with that small amount of wine that we're making. Cool. All right, Lisa, where can people taste your wine? Right. So you can visit us here in Walla Walla at our flagship tasting room, or you can also visit us in Seattle. We, uh, in 2019, opened a tasting room near Pioneer Square. Cool. And we have some big release weekends coming up, so it would be a good time to make a trip either to us in Seattle or us in Walla Walla. Is there a website that people can go to to find out about those events? So foundryvineyards.com. Boundaryvineyards.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, that is our show for today. Thank you to all of our guests. That was a really amazing conversation. And thank you to everybody who um, stayed with us. Uh, and thank you for being curious about our state. We're so lucky to live in such an amazing place. I hope you take advantage and explore on your own. Please remember to support your local businesses during COVID. A great way to do that is by visiting showwildlove.com. There you'll find gift cards available for over a thousand Washington businesses. Every gift card purchased is not only a gift for yourself or your loved one, but it's also a gift to that local business and helps make it more likely they'll still be here when this COVID crisis is over. So uh, we're going to take it. We're not coming back in two weeks, but we will be back in May and we're going to talk about all the best barbecue spots uh, in Washington state. So please join us in May and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.